This is the start of a new series where I'll be looking at Darkwing Duck comics published across the years since the debut of the cartoon. Apart from reading Darkwing Duck comics with my older brother when I was growing up, the first comics I ever bought featuring this character were from the 2016 Darkwing Duck series, published by Joe Books, and I enjoyed all of them. Book after book, I continued to be impressed until I became convinced that the duo behind most of these books, Aaron Sparrow and James Silvani, really get what the appeal of this character is and how to tell stories which fit with this character's history. In my previous reviews, I've not only said that I think this series deserves the highest recommendation possible for anyone who loves the Darkwing Duck character, but it's also an admirable example of a creative team paying attention to a character's history. Being a Darkwing Duck fan before you read these comics doesn't hurt, but the stories they are telling have weight that would appeal to any comics fan. The first Darkwing Duck omnibus, dubbed the Definitively Dangerous Edition, collects issues 1 through 16 and their first annual issue, published by Boom Studios. Because comic book numbering can be a little confusing at times, I'm generally going to refer to this run as the 2010 series. My goal for this video series is to talk about the comics enough so that we can think about it critically. When I read comics, I try to identify strengths and weaknesses in the art and story to improve my own work. This video isn't going to be a detailed plot summary, because I don't want these videos to be a replacement to you actually purchasing and enjoying these stories yourself. But if you like hearing more about a comic series before you purchase it, I'm hoping discussing some of the plot and character beats might help convince you to help move the needle for this series. To sum up my spoiler-free review, Darkwing Duck captures the humor and adventure of the original series while delivering fresh ideas and themes. It goes far beyond cashing in on nostalgia and shows what creativity and passion looks like in comic storytelling. Oh, hang on. Spoiler alert! Okay. The comics in the 2010 series were each divided into four-issue story arcs, published as trade paperbacks. The first story, which is appropriately titled Duck Knight Returns and parodies Frank Miller's legendary Batman story, The Dark Knight Returns, tells the story of Drake Mallard, the mild-mannered alter ego of DW, coming out of retirement to battle a new kind of enemy, the Quackworks Corporation. One of the strengths of this first story is that it's not just a comedic retelling of The Dark Knight Returns, with DW in the place of Batman. This is a formula break for DW's character. The Disney cartoon had to be episodic. With the exception of a few returning villains and secondary characters, there was a rigorous status quo to the world Darkwing Duck lived in. This series opens with a bit of a sucker punch for Darkwing Duck fans. The hero has been brought low completely forgotten by the citizens of St. Cunard, giving up his cape and cowl to perform a soul-crushing office job, working in the Quackworks Corporation HQ to support his adopted daughter's education. In true dystopian fashion, crime bots now perform police work, eliminating the need for costumed superheroes. You are already probably picking up on some key themes, the evil corporate conglomerate and robots replacing human beings as storytelling motifs. One of the things I like that has always resonated with me about the Darkwing Duck character is his moral fiber. When Quackworks robots break into his home and endanger his daughter Goslin and her friend Honker, Darkwing begins investigating the Quackworks Corporation out of concern for protecting his family. In contrast, the team of supervillains, Quackerjack in particular, just want to blow up everything because they are tired of living in the sterile corporate world created by Quackworks. What seems like a goofy superhero story has a deeper moral message. Darkwing seeks justice and is motivated to protect his family, while the villains seek anarchy and are motivated by selfish revenge. They also nicely foreshadow a future villain's appearance. Fans of the show will recall that the Fearsome Five were originally led by Negaduck, but their fearful and angry reactions at the mere mention of Negaduck's name hints at things to come. In addition to supplying plenty of explosions and battles with hordes of robots, this series also knows when to take a break and underscore what makes DW a great character. After DW is comedically misidentified as a croon singer and forced to sing at an old employee's retirement party to avoid blowing his cover, the old employee, 
Maury Thwackstein, is the first person to recognize Darkwing Duck as the hero who once defended St. Cunard. After giving DW a lead on the Quackworks Corporation's shady dealings, Thwackstein tells DW, My memory's better than most, son, and I know a hero when I see one. This is a key moment because, in a world that has forgotten who Darkwing Duck was and what individualistic heroism looks like, and where even the hero himself has struggled with feeling like he's not the man he once was, this old man is the first person, apart from Goslin, to remind D.W. of who he once was and the hero he can be. Essentially, this scene is underscoring the importance of individualism. After a spectacular battle with an army of robots, Darkwing is rescued in the nick of time by Launchpad McQuack and Goslin. The celebration is short-lived as DW and Launchpad begin arguing over that one incident. Immediately, we flash back to that one incident, and like the whole story so far, this scene is something that is both a formula break and a gut punch for fans of the old show. Remember the earlier scenes foreshadowing Negaduck? This is where that starts to pay off. Negaduck is my favorite villain from the Darkwing Duck TV series, and one reason why is, in a bright and colorful cartoon world, they were able to get away with portraying a psychopathic villain. Sure, they were able to play him as comedically evil, but rewatch the Darkwing Duck show if you haven't in a while. Negaduck is very clearly a sadistic and malevolent character, meaning he's not just an evil copy of the hero, like so many comic book characters who fit into that motif. Because he's sadistic, Negaduck is a moral antithesis to everything DW is. DW is somewhat smug, but overall he's a loving and capable father figure. In my opinion, he's one of the best representations of the importance of fatherhood in children's entertainment. The reason I like Negaduck is he effectively represents every father's greatest fear. Someone malevolent enough to come after your family. I like it when children's entertainment doesn't shy away from representing truly malevolent characters. In a cozy domestic scene, Drake Mallard jokes about something very down-to-earth and identifiable. He's worried about what would happen if his hyperactive daughter ever had caffeine. This is a small moment, but it's important narratively because it gives us a glimpse of the real-world daily life of these characters. Parents can identify with having hyperactive kids. When Negaduck breaks into Drake's private home, armed to the teeth, He's threatening everything DW loves. I'm sure that classic Spider-Man stories where Spidey's secret identity was threatened helped inspire this scene. Seeing a simple, heroic character you love being threatened in his home has impact. Though Darkwing Duck fans regularly got to see DW's concern for his daughter's safety in the TV show, we've never gotten to see a scene where DW's life and happiness has been threatened like this. Because the creative team gets the character, they play Darkwing Duck well. He immediately tells Launchpad to take Goslin and go, and confronts Negaduck himself in his dorky sweater vest. I'm going to read a bit of this dialogue so I can talk about why I think this is such great writing. And apologies for my Jim Cummings impression. Says Darkwing, Listen, Negaduck, you may not know it yet, but you've just made the biggest mistake of your life. Oh. So, immediately after we see D.W.'s concern for his daughter, we see him make a brash statement, and instantly, he's in his enemy's clutches. He's heroic, yes, but he's comedically disadvantaged. Says Negaduck, And who better than you to lecture me about making mistakes? Because compared to the one you've been making, mine won't even crack the top 20. It's that pea brain pilot of yours. He was the key to all of this. See, I was taking the laundry to the worst dry cleaners in town, and guess who I saw coming out? Your big galoot of a sidekick, carrying two pairs of clothes. The first, a pathetic purple version of my fancy duds. The other, an ugly green vest and, ha, huh, pink shirt. Actually, it's salmon. Okay, let's back up. Here is why this scene works. The creators have observed an interesting plot hole about the logic of the original show. When your series is episodic and has to maintain a status quo, it's rare to see life-changing moments. Launchpad can be both Darkwing Duck and Drake Mallard's friend because the cartoon has a status quo. 
the comic series gave the creators a chance to tell a continuous story about these characters. This is an interesting thing to happen to your hero, but it's something you can only use once. What if Launchpad's relationship to Drake Mallard and DW exposed them to danger? Once you use a plot idea like that, you've got to make it count because it has consequences. Second, the dialogue nails how these characters speak. Both speak in a sort of dramatic purple prose style, but Negaduck is noticeably more aggressive than Darkwing Duck is. But even the villain's monologue doesn't drone on and on. Each sentence is telling us something we need to know so that even a brand new reader will be able to understand these characters. Negaduck resents DW's pathetic purple version of his fancy duds because he sees DW's existence as an insult to his pride. The gags about the dry cleaners and DW defending his salmon shirt helps add a little levity to a frightening scene. But because we've been shown that DW is a good dad, this scene has weight and emotional resonance. Skipping ahead a little, Negaduck says, You wanted to live in two worlds, adventurer, family man. Too bad you couldn't keep your world separate, because now I'm going to rip them both apart. When I first read this, it actually gave me the heebie-jeebies. Narratively, Negaduck represents a primal fear that any parent could identify with. The fear that your family, your entire world, could be taken away from you by someone with malicious intent. Evil ducks from the Negaverse don't exist, but Negaduck represents a kind of evil which does exist in the real world. I'm sure a site like TV Tropes has documented scores of scenes where the villain suddenly appears in the hero's home after a quiet, peaceful moment. But for that kind of scene to have emotional impact, you have to be invested in the innocent characters being threatened. If the comic book series opened with a shocking moment like this, old fans of the cartoon would have been invested, but new readers wouldn't have a connection with the characters yet. This comic series has shown us Drake Mallard's sacrificial work ethic for the sake of Goslin's education and the pride Goslin has for her adopted father's heroism. You have to earn a scene like this for it to have this kind of impact. So let's back up again. Four pages of comic art. In that time, Sparrow has established a setting, used a gag to set up the villain's entrance, showed both the protagonist's heroism and his defeat, delivered on a great story idea which addresses an interesting question from the original source material, communicated the nature of the villain's evil, his pride, and his motivation for hating the protagonist, used gags which helped explain the character's personalities, and gave the villain a speech which exposes the hero's greatest weakness his friendships, and his love for his family as something to be exploited. Writers, respect your reader's time. This is great, tightly packed pacing. This whole flashback, of course, sets up why Darkwing chose to abandon his old heroic idealism. Gosselin's interaction with her father is another example of the moral fiber of these stories. I've said before that I think Drake and Gosselin Mallard is one of the most positive father-daughter relationships depicted in children's entertainment, and I think this little exchange underscores my point. Now, one way to read this scene is that Gosselin is being defiant of her father and telling him what to do, as if Gosselin is the smart parent and Drake is the naive child in the relationship, but that's not my read on this scene at all. Gosselin is a mischievous tomboy sort of character. She gets in trouble, sure, but her respect for her father is a recurring theme, even in episodes where the two are butting heads. Here, after she hears her dad try to explain why he abandoned heroism, seemingly for a perfectly good reason to protect his family, she says to Darkwing, You're always saying, let's get dangerous. You don't say, let's get dangerous unless they find out where we live, and you certainly don't say, let's get dangerous unless we can't afford it. In her comedic, spitfire fashion, Goslin is expressing ideas about moral virtue here. A hero's virtue is tested precisely when it requires sacrifice to do what is right. Goslin is acting like a moral conscience here, reminding her father of what the right thing to do is. 
In the age of doxing as a weapon to target political opponents, Gosselin's words have gained even more resonance. After these great character building scenes, we get more action, including a high speed chase scene in the air with multiple enemies coming together. I think this is as good an opportunity as any to talk about the blend of comedy and action in these comics. Comedy can vary according to people's tastes. For example, I really like the random quirkiness of British comedy, but tee hee it's so random jokes can also become grating. I think Darkwing Duck's solution to this problem is to have a mix. There's some slapstick and other physical comedy, there's some wordplay, some random goofiness, some poetic justice, and some gags which rely on cultural references, all rolled into one. Take this billboard for example. Quackworks, we're your friends that are always right. Since we've gotten the dystopian vibe, this gag lands because it's an ironic twist on both corporate advertising and famous slogans like, Big Brother is watching you. We don't get to see much of the shadowy Quackworks Corporation, so moments like this help give it some personality while adding comic relief. I'd say I chuckled at least once per page, and I did laugh out loud at some of the hidden gags. Let me know in the comments section if you find any hidden jokes while reading this comic. Or would you be interested in seeing me do a hidden Easter egg style video where I show you as many of these subtle gags as I can find? Back to the comic, as I've been reading creator interviews about this series, it's become clear that they were interested in pushing these characters forward based on material that came before. And one aspect of that is how they are characterizing the villains. A lot of the villains in Darkwing Duck are played for laughs, and they look like send-ups of popular tropes in superhero stories. The evil version of the good guy, the clown bad guy, the electric bad guy, the plant bad guy, the elemental powered bad guy. The Duck Knight Returns starts setting up a narrative arc for Quacker Jack, who at first glance seems like a straight up knockoff of the Joker, with a little bit of the Toy Man mixed in. Quacker Jack clearly resents Negaduck's pride, and he wants to become a more serious threat, someone who Negaduck can't push around. So, Negaduck's evil is actually motivating other villains to change their behavior. After both the heroes and the villains are captured by the crime bots, they are brought face to face with the evil mastermind behind Quackworks. I think fans of the TV show, in particular, will be so excited to see this reveal I refuse to spoil it. Sorry gang, you're going to have to buy the trade paperback or the omnibus to see all the great twists in issue 4. And there are at least three separate surprises that Disney Duck fans will decidedly dig. At this point, I think I've made my point about how this story's moral themes add emotional impact to the humor and action. And the last issue in The Duck Knight Returns also has an emotionally impactful moment where we see heroic self-sacrifice. You'll know it when you see it. I got choked up reading it. The definitively dangerous omnibus is over 400 pages, with three additional story arcs following The Duck Knight Returns, and I plan to get numerous vids out of this epic series. I've included links to where you can purchase both physical and digital editions of either this omnibus or if you're really poor, just Volume 1 with The Duck Knight Returns to start with. Issue 4 delivers on all of the promises from Issues 1 through 3. It adds several neat twists for fans of the Disney afternoon shows, and it features the same tight, impactful writing style and moral themes I've praised enthusiastically in this video. Most importantly, it's an actual climax, cranking up the intensity and the stakes for an all-out battle between multiple parties. For now, I'll just say this. Who is Darkwing Duck's greatest enemy? I've already mentioned that Negaduck is my personal favorite, but it's a testament to this creative team that their comics show so much appreciation to the source material, they use multiple villains to great effect in their first four issues. They definitely deserved the positive fan reaction they received back in 2010. Just as a fun aside, did you know that Young Justice co-creator Greg Wiseman worked on the original Darkwing Duck cartoon under the mentorship of Tad Stones and other Disney pros? Wiseman writes the introduction for this omnibus and briefly recounts what it was like to work behind the scenes. 
I did not know this about Wiseman, and I really enjoyed getting to see a glimpse of two generations of animators working together on one show. Please let me know in the comments section if my video has encouraged you to try this series out for the first time, or return to it. I'd love to hear from you. Also, if you do get this series, why not take a photo or screenshot of the version you get and use the hashtag MoveTheNeedle on social media to let your friends know what comics you're enjoying. Feel free to add me on Twitter, where I use the handle N01MarmadukeFan. It makes my day when I hear from people who've gotten comics based on my recommendation. If you dug this review, please like this video, comment with your thoughts, and subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified of future Disney comic reviews. With that, this is your boy, number one Marmaduke fan, signing off. I love you guys, and I'll catch you later. We don't get to see much of the shadowy Quackworks Corporation, so moments like this help give it some personality. Burp Squad.